Good Wednesday evening of Holy Week. It is so good to be with you as always, and I'm grateful for the ability we have to join our hearts and our minds and our spirits together as we open God's Word tonight. We're walking ever closer to the cross. We don't know exactly what all Jesus did on this particular day. We do know that tomorrow will be his last supper with his disciples, his time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his arrest. And then Friday comes the crucifixion, the time when the spotless Lamb of God took on the sins of the world and won our salvation. This week during these meditation times, we've been looking at Jesus' last words from the cross. We've heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To the thief on the cross next to him, he said, Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And to his mother Mary and his disciple John, Woman, behold your son, Son, behold your mother. And tonight, we're going to hear Jesus cry out in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before we look at our scripture for tonight, which is coming from the Gospel of Matthew, let's open with a word of prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit upon, Give us grace to accept joyfully the sufferings of the present time, confident of the glory that shall be revealed through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture for tonight comes from the 27th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning at the 45th verse. Let's read that together. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we get to Jesus' actual words, I don't want us to miss how the stage is set. Darkness covers the land. At the very time of day when the sun is supposed to be at its highest, we don't see it at all. It's as if all nature knows that the most grievous thing ever to happen in all of history is happening right now. But as out of the ordinary as it seems, we can hardly really consider it surprising, not if we remember the words of the prophets who had spoken hundreds of years before of the coming day of the Lord. Listen to the voice of the prophet Amos, who said in the eighth chapter of his book, In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like mourning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. The people of Israel had always pictured the day of the Lord as one when God's Messiah would come in power and triumph to overthrow the oppressive powers of Rome. It would be a day of vindication for them, one to celebrate. And they seemed to have completely forgotten that they'd been warned by the prophets that the longed-for day of the Lord would be a day of darkness and not of light. And here it is. Calvin calls the darkness an incomparable proof of God's anger. Others believe it signifies God's mourning for his only son. Dale Bruner, one of my very favorite theologians and writers and who provided me much material for this message, so I want to give him credit, describes it this way. Perhaps the Lord cast dark clouds and deep gloom across the face of the earth to say meteorologically, naturally, physically, and in sign language, this is it. As at the beginning, Jesus was singled out in baptism with open heavens, the descending dove, and the divine voice. So now at the end is he singled out again, but this time cosmically. For here the human race has committed its most heinous crime. The Son of God came to it, and in response, the world's best religion and its most advanced government combined to kill him. 
In great sympathy with its creator and his son, the earth plunges into darkness. It is, from all appearances, a day unlike any other. You might recognize that the cry that comes from Jesus' mouth is the opening verse of Psalm 22. Unlike the others around him who were likely screaming in pain and rage, Jesus instead cries out in a prayer. Interestingly, this is the only time Matthew in his gospel gives us Jesus' words in his native tongue, Aramaic. And Bruner notes that it, it's as if what Jesus says now is so sacred that the gospel writer wanted to give it to us in his very language. It's also interesting that Jesus' last sentence before death was not an affirmation or an exclamation, but a question. We can imagine that Jesus might have wanted to leave us with one last important thought, like, love your neighbor as yourself, that's the great commandment. But instead, we see God's Son, who spent his earthly ministry teaching us about the kingdom of heaven and how to belong in it, is now asking a question of God, just as we sometimes do. And in so doing, he is showing us that questions to the almighty ruler of the universe are okay. Isn't that a comfort today when so many questions abound for us? And Jesus begins with a why question, so often the most difficult to answer. The who, what, when, where questions typically have an answer that we can look up if we don't know. But the whys of our lives many times take deep, take deep reflection even counseling sometimes, to figure out. For Jesus to ask why is really a gift to us. It demonstrates that even the wisest, most creative, enlightened thinkers don't always know why some things happen. And in a bigger way, he's showing us that there are questions in the world and in our lives that are simply un we are simply unable to answer, and that's okay. He begins his statement, though, with the words, my God, my God. What, what might we take from that that he doesn't call out my father, as he had with his first statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Well, he's used also a very strong verb in this sentence, forsaken, meaning abandoned. Jesus has known God's love, his father's love from eternity past, and has taken time during his earthly ministry many times to be with the Father in prayer alone to know his presence. When he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was honest about his comfort level with what was about to happen, but he knew the Father was with him, and he prayed that his will would be done. Here, though, in this moment at the cross, he feels completely abandoned. Have you ever felt abandoned? Maybe by the one person who was most important in your life, possibly through divorce or even outright rejection. If you have, then you likely know the hellishness of this kind of anguish. Multiply that times infinity, and we might approach the anguish of Jesus at this moment. As Bruner describes, when God's presence goes, the lights go out. Here, Jesus' lifeline has been cut. He dies before he dies. This is his descent into hell. And think about it. Jesus wasn't surprised that all of his disciples or every member of his family wasn't there as he was crucified. But God? God is the one who has always been with him since before the beginning. Always powerful, always comforting. And now he's estranged. Of course, he has to be. C.S. Lewis writes, God the Father forsook God the Son because the judge couldn't look upon the sin bearer. Jesus was in those moments no longer spotless. He was thoroughly stained with our sin. He was no longer faultless. He was guilty through and through with our sin. God couldn't help him. God could not even face him. But here's the gospel good news of this statement of Jesus. Even though this word from the cross looks like a cry of despair and maybe a temporary loss of faith, Jesus teaches us right here, perhaps better than anywhere else, exactly what faith is at its core. And that is believing God even when we don't feel him. As Bruner ponders, if Jesus had said, my people, my people, why has God abandoned me? 
We could believe that at the very end, Jesus really did give up on God and did despair. Then God would have to be very questionable to us in crises too. But when God asked a God about God's absence, Jesus may have taught faith better than in any other story in the gospel. Real faith may be calling on God even when experience says God is not there. I've heard folks question where God is during these days of deep hardship for our country, for many of us individually. Well, there's a lot about those questions I can't answer. But the truth that I do know is this. He has not abandoned us. The only thing that could separate us from him is our sin. And Jesus took care of that for us on this cross. But when our, because of our suffering or our questions or our worries, we're tempted to believe that he's not here. We can look to that cross. We can see there the one who hung there in pure agony with his father's face turned away from him, experiencing the deepest anguish of hell, but demonstrating even by his question his ultimate trust in God. He suffered what we deserved so that we wouldn't have to. He trusted in spite of everything around him, the faithfulness of his father, so that we can trust it too. And in the last verse of our passage, Jesus, in a loud voice, gave up his spirit, the same spirit that he will give to the church at Pentecost. Hope has come from despair, trust from seeming abandonment. I pray we will take both hope and trust into the days ahead, giving thanks for the one who saved us and glorifying the Father whose wrath was satisfied in him. Would you pray with me? Father, it is true, those lines that we sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Thank you, Lord, for, for giving us the opportunity tonight to think not only about the amazing gift we've been given in our redemption, but also about what it actually cost Jesus. He was separated from you, and all creation groaned with the pain of it that you could love us that much to allow your only son to suffer and die for us is so hard for us to wrap our heads around. But help us not to take his sacrifice and his pain, the agony he must have felt, for granted. Instead, may we look to him on the cross, crying out these words and marvel at what you have done for us. And then, Lord, help us to live in a way that fittingly shows our love for and trust in you. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we give you all honor and glory through the power of your name. Amen. As we leave this time together to live out our lives, may we do so hearing the word of God to us. May you, being rooted and established in love, have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.